Thank you, Mitch. Today, it is my privilege to introduce our speaker, Jerry Eisenberg, who will be talking about Newark then and now. Jerry is a Jersey guy, born in Newark, schooled at Newark Redkers, and the outstanding sports journalist at the Star Ledger. His career at the Star Ledger began while he was still a student at Rutgers. Shortly thereafter, he served his country during the Korean War. Jerry has produced literally thousands of newspaper columns and magazine articles. And he has authored 17 books, the most recent of which is Once There Were Giants, The Golden Age of Heavyweight Boxing. Jerry's sports journalism has received numerous accolades. He was inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame of New Jersey, the National Sportscasters and Sports Writers Association Hall of Fame, the Boxing Hall of Fame, the New Jersey Hall of Fame, and the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. In 2000, he won the Red Smith Award from the Associated Press Sports Editors. All of Jerry's 17 books, save one, were nonfiction. His 16th book, After the Fire, was his only novel. It will be central to his talk today. He is particularly proud of it. In fact, he will tell you that writing it was at the top of his bucket list. Jerry, thank you so much for being with the Old Guard today and returning next Tuesday. The microphone is yours. All right, well, this is the book, After the Fire, Love and Hate in the Ashes of 1967, which refers to the riot, of course. <clears throat> I covered the riot. Um, Everybody, including the janitor, covered the riot. I mean, you go on the street, you had a telephone and you called. And it, it, um, the city, of course, was never the same. It was a catharsis, but that took a long time in coming. This book is a story of, it starts out, first of all, the tension in Newark. Newark holds the, uh, probably the indoor armory record for indicted mayors in succession. <sighs> We had three, and they came right around. The first one was right around this time, was at an easier. And um, as a result of that, um, the tensions built in work, and it was very clear most of the minorities, not all, not all the people, but in, in terms of their significance, had moved out of the city. Yeah, what, were, what was left were the Portuguese in the East Ward, which, by the way, is the uh, second, third, third largest Portuguese community in the world, Lisbon and Fall River, Massachusetts, if that means anything. I kind of useless information. I'll back you in out of my head right now. And then we had the Italians who uh, were really rock hard uh, citizens of Newark early. And uh, we had the Blacks. The Blacks came to Newark, you know, in, uh, with World War II because the defense plants, they called them, uh, Worthington Pump, RCA, uh, Westinghouse, they all opened and they needed people to work. And what happened was, as a result of that, there was a vacuum. It was clear that the Blacks and the Italians politically we're going to be fighting for who is going to control the city. And the fighting was horribly acrimonious. And I will say this book, this book is about a lot of things, but it's also about an interracial love affair. And I know a little bit about that because my wife is Afro-American. And we started dating five years after the riot. And believe me, it was tough. It was tough. Uh, it got better and uh, but it, it wasn't a pleasant thing. So a lot of the things in this book, the love affair between the Italian kid, captain of the football team at Montclair State, and the black girl who transfers into Montclair State because they have met in the summer job. Um, part of it, it keeps going back to that, are they going to make it? Because the, anybody who, uh, in, in, in this Zoom audience who's read the book understands the problems they have. Um, and it, it really pinpoints that. And the biggest thing about it is, this is a book about hope. I have great hopes for the city. I, 
I haven't been here in a while. I, I ran away from taxes and snow. So I guess that makes me ineligible. I'd have to move to Summit, and I don't think I could do that. But um, I'll be here in spirit. And I said, they gave me a day at, uh, at uh, the state legislature. And uh, I remember walking in a room was packed. And I said, I know why all you guys are here. You want to make sure I'm leaving. And I know the city. And I said, don't worry. I will be back with, with our honesty record. I'll be back next year. And I will vote for every single person in this room. And I think they expected me. That's Newark. That's New Jersey. Um, I do miss the state. I really do. I miss the mores. I miss the language. Now, this book here, uh, the editor on this book calls me up. And she says to me, you know, there's a lot of typos in this manuscript. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you said the guy said I didn't do it. And he said, I'm going to ask you a quick. I said, lady, that's not written in English. That's written in New Jersey. And uh, I, the big thing about this book, this is what I call a dialogue book. I used to love dialogue movies, you know? I really, you know, when the actor and the actress said, you were in a room with them. Now they chase cars, they blow them up, they shoot to the top of the building. I, I don't go to movies anymore. But this book is a dialogue book. And it feels like home. And one of the things that is an old game that um, in my youth, um, I don't know if they still do it, but in my youth, uh, Afro-American kids used to play on three corners called the dozens. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I'll, I'll break it down for you. One kid says, your mother is so fat, she waddles when she walks. And the other kid says, yeah, I noticed that when she's coming into my bed last night. It's back and forth. Now. Well, that's New Jersey. I mean, uh, I told it to a, a black guy that long ago. You don't have a monopoly on that. New Jersey, everybody is always topping everybody. The hero in this book, the Italian kid, gets shot in a racial incident. And he's home in, the, uh, in his living room, and the heroine is there with him. She finally got past the parents. I'll make this point, and you'll know how it was in Newark in those days. It took nine chapters before the Italian boy and the black girl told the black girl's mother. It took 32 chapters before they told the Italian's parents. Uh, and that scene is, a, I'm very proud of that scene. Uh, it, it's just um, the way it was. But but I the city's come together a lot since then. Investment has helped tremendously, um, and um, also I it, it's a strange kind of integration. A lot of Italians left Newark after the riot, or as soon as they could retire, maybe, and went down to Jersey Shore. Um, they were replaced in the North Ward by the Puerto Ricans. But the city, I'm not a super fan of the current mayor, but he's trying. And he's getting some cooperation from businesses he needs, or Prudential put its international headquarters there. So uh, it's my town. I love this town. When I go, and I'm not talking much about the book, but that's OK. If you're bored with money, we got the money, don't worry. Uh, I grew up in Newark. We had the Newark Bears in 2000, the real Newark Bears, not the Ersatz group that followed them years later. In, in 2001, they were voted the greatest minor league franchise anywhere in the history of minor league baseball in America. My first ball game was that critical team, 1937, the first game I ever saw. They won the pennant by 25 and a half games. The Yankees owned the team. Everybody on that team, if they didn't play for the Yankees, the Yankees actually sold these guys for $50,000. That was a tremendous amount of money. Those days. We also had the Newark Eagles, an all-black team. Monty Irvin, Larry Doby, Ray, uh, Ray um, third baseman, I forget his last name, but uh, Danridge, Ray Danridge. They had a guy on this team who never played one inning of what the white 
group used to call organized war because they, they felt the black Greeks were disorganized. This guy's name was Leon Day. They always played a short season. And then they went out and played against barnstorming teams. And then they played against towns just to make it. And then they went overseas. They went to Cuba, they went to Venezuela, they went to Mexico uh, and uh, Puerto Rico. And Monty Irvin, who was a really close friend of mine, I did the eulogy at his funeral. He was the first black man to play in the American League. And um, Monty still holds, uh, in absence of censure, he holds a home run record for, for the Puerto Rican Winter League. Uh, so uh, there was that going on. There was harness racing in Weequake Park. There was the Griffith Music Foundation that I uh, ushered for. Um, there were, um, and they, they, I mean, we had Yuhui Menuhin, Arturo Rubenstein, Fuccio Taglavini. I mean, this was a, a place of real culture. And, and you could go anywhere in the city and do anything in the city. The big festival uh, in the Portuguese East Ward was a big thing. And people got along, they separated, but I think it was a real estate segregation. Really, because when I, I was born at the best time I could have been born. I was born in 1930, and you know what happened in 1929. Therefore, when I left for the Korean War, when I came back, that was the first time I lived in the house with a lock on the door. Because nobody had anything to steal. And, and uh, but you learn about life. You know, I was very, I really was fortunate. My only, I'm getting off the book, but I gotta tell you, this isn't the work. My old man, and it's, the memories are so strong. One day my old man says to me, hey, go out and sweep the sidewalk, I'm 10 years old. What do I know from sweeping the sidewalk? Well, I lived in a Clinton Hill district and, and we all had, they had little homes and, but they were very proud of them. So they kept them in the, as best they could. So I'm out there with a broom sweeping the sidewalk into the gutter. And all of a sudden, uh, I see him. My old man never yelled at me, he led by example. He's standing on the steps of the porch with his arms folded. And he says to me, um, are you done? I said, yeah, it looks like I'm done. I knew I'd done something wrong, but he wouldn't go away. He said, well, you're really not done. What are you going to do? I said, well, I want to go play baseball. He said, you can play baseball, but not now. Get a dustpan. You know the garbage cans are in the back of the house. This is the Eisenberg garbage. It's not the garbage of the city. You will pick up every piece of garbage you swept into the, into the gutter, take it back to the garbage cans, and then you'll go play baseball. Well, I looked at him and I said, why? Now that's probably as close as I ever came to death at a young age. But he controlled himself and he said, you know, I'm gonna tell you why. And after I tell you, this will be my answer. Every moment you live under this roof will you say to me why, this is the answer. So get used to it. You know, all the bars and saloons used to have free lunch on the, on the bar. Hard boiled eggs, stale bread, a little ham, pig's knuckles or whatever. I know I never ate them, so I never tried them. I don't intend to. So anyway, uh, then they discovered one day, we don't have to do this anymore. People are coming in here in the summer, it's hot, they're buying beer, they're, we're not gonna do it. My father, this is my father telling me the story. The last place that we know of to have the free lunch was the White Rose Bar over in New York. And then one day, the White Rose Bar said, we're not gonna do this anymore. So this is why I'm saying, you ask me why, there is no longer a free lunch in America. Get your skinny ass down in the gutter, pick up that stuff and put it in the garbage can. That's the way you learn lessons growing up. Uh, uh, I remember the first baseball game I went to, there was a guy named Walter Judnick came down from the St. Louis Browns playing in the outfield for the, for the Bears. He hits a foul and ball toward third. Well, my father was a former minor league ball player. And uh, so my father rushes over 
elbows the guy out of the way, makes a one-handed, you know, barehanded catch. Everybody applauds. My father takes the bow. He comes back, hands me the ball. He said, now you're going to go down. We're going to go out there. We're not going to go out the way we came in. We'll go out that exit behind us. And you're going to stand in front of the Bears dressing room. And when Walt Judnick comes out, you're going to be polite. But you're going to say, Mr. Judnick, my dad caught this. He used to play minor league ball. Can you sign it for me? So I did. That ball was with me for a long time. It was one of my prized possessions. Then one day, uh, I guess my 10-year-old daughter decides she wants to play ball, takes it off the shelf, goes out in the mud. His signature, uh, 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 the guy who broke the Japanese code couldn't read that signature when she got finished with it. Well, I'm getting ready to go overseas years and years later. And I'm in Seattle waiting for a troop ship. And uh, not too, no, I'm not too anxious, but I'm waiting. And I said, well, Saturday, I'm going to take my mind off everything. I'm going out to where the Seattle Rainiers played, Pacific Coast League. And I go out there. My father and I were, we had two things. If you, if you thought of our bond as a rope, one end was baseball. We never, ever argued about that. The other end was Judaism, and we kept arguing about that till, till I, he finally passed away. There were good arguments because I learned a lot from him. But anyway, I get out there. I think I'm going to buy him a program and send it back to him. I love that. I open the program up, and who's playing for the Rainiers in left field? Walt Judnick. So I wait till after the game. Now I'm in uniform. He's not going to turn me down. Walk, stand behind the. Uh, you know, in front of the dressing room, he comes out. I said, I can speak to Mr. He said, Oh, sure, sure. So, do what does he want? I tell him the story. He said, Your old man caught it barehanded, huh? I hope I got to hit him a little harder after that. You know? And I laugh and he laughs. And I tell him the story about the ball. And he said, Well, that's one place I've been playing in this league 15 years now. That's one place in America, your show, that I have a little immortality. I said, not exactly. And I tell him the story about my daughter. And he says to me, you want me to sign another one? I said, no, that ball lives forever in the back of my mind. I have nothing but good memories of Newark, really. There's so many things. Uh, you know, your first kiss, your first date, your, uh, all kinds of things that I don't intend to get into because they're none of your business. However, I'm writing a book about that, and that's in the future. I'm writing a book now called Growing Up Jewish in Newark, New Jersey. I do think it's the funniest thing I've ever done. But anyway, the city was wonderful. And, you know, I was not a fan of Gibson, Mayor Gibson at all. But he did say something which, which made a lot, which turned out to be prophetic. He, you know, when he came in, the city was on the cusp. We were changing political power from Italians to Blacks. Um, and a lot of things were changing. And he said, he meant it differently, but he said, wherever the American city is going to get, Newark's going to get there first. And they did. And it wasn't a good place to be. But you grow. Things, you learn that things are different. They're not bad, necessarily. And they, they, they've done a pretty good job of rehabilitating it. OK, so these kids. Where can these kids meet? The Italian guy, he's a, going into his junior year at Montclair State. She's graduating Essex County College and looking for a place, junior college, looking for a place to transfer. Only place that, and this is six months after the riot, the only place they could meet, the post office, because the Italians control the jobs. So he had summer employment. And the postal service now is looking for more blacks to, you know, cosmetically. So she had some employment. And they are sorting mail side by side. She won't look at him. She went to Barringer four years before in the first group of blacks to come in. It was not a pleasant experience. She's not mad at him. She's mad at Barringer. She's mad at the, at the world because of, she didn't get everything out of her high school socially she wanted. So she won't look at him. And he says to her, you know, miss, I, I, I think I know you. I really think, she said, you don't know me. No, no, I'm sure I know your face, but you, know, you recognize me. 
that's a little different than knowing me. Uh, well, I'm sure I, you're sure of nothing. I'm sure a black beacon in a sea of white faces did not get your attention whatsoever. And if you want to do me a favor, stop talking. Because the next thing you're going to say is some of your best friends are black. And now they're sorting me all these looking at, but he's still looking at her sideways out of the corner of his eyes. And, this is one attractive lady. Now, uh, a guy comes over, he's a, got a political job. He gets her, even, it's her first day at work, maneuvers her into a corner and he's groping her. Well, 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 I was told by my father and everybody in this audience who grew up in Newark, if you came from any kind of an ethnic house, you were told the same thing. If a girl's in trouble, it's your problem. And if it's your sister, break his neck. So without thinking, Junior Fischella jumps off the stool, goes over there, left hooks the guy in a bread basket. The guy goes down, he throws up, he's laying there. Now he turns around and comes back. Well, she walks back. She said, geez, he didn't have to do that. I don't know who would do that for me. I got to apologize to him. So she says, you know, I owe you an apology. He says, you don't owe me crap. You don't owe me crap, but I'm not apologizing for slavery either. I had nothing to do with it. And then he says, you want to do me a favor? Stop talking, because in a minute, you're going to say most of your best friends are black. They look at each other. They laugh. And that's how the love affair starts. Their first date parallel. I will say this. There's a scene in this book, one of my favorites, where they're this interracial couple goes on their first date. To go on a date, uh, it was incredible how he keeps begging her. He wants to go. She wants to go. She's confiding in her girlfriend. She can't tell her mother. The city's in turmoil. I mean, really in turmoil. Man. But they go. And they go to Chinatown. He takes her to Chinatown because there's nobody white, there's nobody black, and they're not going to get stared at. My first date with my wife, we went to Little Italy. Nobody stared at anything in Little Italy. So. But we came back on the Staten Island Ferry, and the kids in this book come back on the Staten Island Ferry. And I can tell you honestly and proudly, every piece of dialogue on that boat, that ship, was my wife and me. That's exactly what it was. I used that scene totally. And, and, uh, and it works pretty good. And uh, I got to tell you this, if you think back to your youth, if you think you're falling in love, if you don't quite want to admit it yet, stay the hell off the Staten Island Ferry under a full moon, but you've got no chance. That's where I fell in love, and that's where these kids really fell in love. After that happened, uh, I don't want to overstay my welcome, but in this there's a three-cornered race for mayor. A guy, a black guy who lives in um, mountain lakes. I am positive that at least since the Mesozoic period, no black guy has lived in mountain lakes. And, and uh, that's done for a reason. He sees a black nationalist and the president of the North Ward White Citizens Council vying for mayor. Well, he's got his father, a big hedge fund guy. His father has the money. Obviously, they wouldn't be in Mountain Lakes. And he knows the bankers. So he comes to Newark and challenges the two of them. Now it's a three quarter election. Also, in the, now the mafia is going to fix the election if they can. Now, the three mafiosos, I use the real names. I knew two of them very well. One was Carlo Gambino, who I knew, and the other was Richie the Boot. Um, and Richie, um, Richie controlled most of North Jersey, but Carlo Gambino had just above the shore and coming up to, and a little bit of Newark too. They both had headquarters in the city. I've been in those headquarters with them. See, what happened with me with the mafia is very simple. The key to my relationship with the mafia, and there's a lot of those guys, boxing. That's when Frankie Carbo ran boxing. Blinky Palermo got a piece of every contract. 
they they and my bot team book gets into that area, which is era, which is quite interesting. And and they control the city in many ways. They decide if they well, it, it, there's a hustler up there who's got a self improvement group. And he wants, if he could get these guys, now this is true because they try to kill each other. It's documented, each guy at one point or another. But this is business, so we'll talk, we'll, we'll look at it another way. They're going to try to fix the election because all they want to know is who gets to drive the garbage trucks. That's all they care about. You don't need anything else after that, right? So, okay, so uh, this is going on. And at the same time, uh the hero is having his he's having his problems um they tell the mother but they don't tell the mother till what happens is they finally become intimate in branchbrook park and the reason they can do it in branchbrook park is it's the fourth of july and on the fourth of july when i was growing up Fireworks in school stadium, right up the block. People sitting on the grass in the stands, maybe 30,000 people, you know. And he says, I'm going to take you to the fireworks. And she said, you're not taking me anywhere. That's in the North Ward. I'm not going up there. Yet. He said, I didn't say all I said, you will see the fire. He takes you to Branch Park, Park, which is like four blocks down the street, and it's empty. And so that's where they, where they culminate their physical romance and now because she her mother has told her mother has got a tough life her mother is patterned after a woman i used to know very well whose husband used to beat the crap out of her um he was a newark cop um she um, had two kids he walked out she threw him out she had a, she worked in the phone company which is a typical story for the time and they lived in a project until she saved every penny she could get. We used to give the telephone operator stock in the 30s and 40s and maybe even the 50s. And she saved a little. She had to get out of the, she was in Hayes Homes and her daughter's best friend was raped and thrown off the roof. So she's going to take, she, she gives them a lecture and she says, just remember this, you live in the projects. The projects will never live in you if I have anything to say about it. And it, there's a lot of this philosophy and, and, and it fits with the city and the mentality of the city. It really does. So um, they start going together. The mayor thing is on now. Uh, and the mafioso, they're busy. As a matter of fact, that poor editor who didn't understand the way people talk in New Jersey, as I told you earlier, she called me up and she said, you know, um, well, I called her and I said, look, there's a guy in this book who is real. His name was uh, Louis. I called him Uncle Louis in the book. But he was the only one who I used in the book who I thought I might have a little trouble with later because he was an old guy living with his family and his kids. And I don't want someone to say, well, you know, you should get some money for this or whatever. So I called her up, the editor, and I said, listen, go through this book and take out every reference to Uncle Louie and make him Uncle Petey, which he now is in this book. So she said to me, and you gotta understand this editor, she's from Enid, Oklahoma. And if you haven't been to Enid, Oklahoma, I have, and I can tell you don't go. Just don't go. It, 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 it's not worth five minutes of your time. So she is not what I would call a sophisticated lady. I'm grateful to her because nobody wanted to touch the novel but her, and we made money with her. I didn't care about the money. I wanted, I wanted the novel done. The novel is my life and my heart. You know, the other books, I love them, but not like, some of them, but not like this. And I put everything I had into this book. It's 112,000 words. It took me. 18 months to write and a lot of thought before I started writing it. And uh, so she, I call her up, I say, let's make the change. So she sends me an email and she says, 
uh, I did it, but why did I have to do that? And I sent her an email back saying, lady, because he's a genuine mafioso. He was a gopher. Now he hangs around a bunch of court in Branchbrook Park, counting the old age and everything. He's like 84. He, he dresses like he's coming out of a 1936 uh, movie. And uh, she said, well, you know this guy, is mafia? And I wrote her, of course I know. She writes me, I am sitting here, now you gotta remember, country girl, I am sitting here in my office in Enid. And I am both thrilled and amazed that you know somebody in the mafia. And I wrote her back, lady, I know a lot of people in the mafia. And if anybody asks you, you take the fifth. I, I, I use a guy in a book who I, who is, I use his name too. Along with your little diary thing. Huh? He had, he had, he had, um, there was a guy, managed fighters. His name was Tommy Ryan, was a manager. He's noom to boxing, you know. But he's an Italian guy. And uh, they, they wouldn't give him a license. And I was there the night. Rocky Castellani, this, I don't know if that name means anything to you older gentlemen. Rocky Castellani was a pretty good fighter from Pennsylvania. And this guy had him, mafia guy. And a fight is fixed. And he's fighting a guy named Ernie the Rock Durando, who looked like he sounds, from Bayonne, New Jersey, so you know he did. Durando knocks him down. The refer the fight is fixed. The judges are fixed. The referee knocks him down, and the, I mean the guy knocks him down, and the referee counts him out. And this guy jumps in the ring and drops the referee with a right hand, goes to the dressing room, and knocks the manager of Castellano down with a right hand. And you'll know the name Al Wild because he managed Rocky Marciano later. So I put this guy in a book. He because we had to have a way. Somebody I had to have a go between them, between the two mafiosos, because they hated each other. The go in between came the sports editor of the Newark Star Ledger. And you know it's not me because this guy won a Pulitzer and I lost 15 nominations. In fact, the editor's book said 15 nominations. That, that's tremendous. I said, no, that means 15 losses. It said, I'm 0 and 15, not 15 and 0. And, and uh, as a result of that, uh, I named, but he had to be Italian because I, it made more sense that he'd be. So I made him Jerry D'Onofrio of the Star Ledger. And he, he gets into all this stuff. And, and, and uh, he's trying to get out of it. He can't because he's pulled by both sides of this thing. These guys, there's a scene in here where they go to Las Vegas, the two mafia, the two lead mafiosos, because Carlo Gambino loved the Rat Pack, loved them. So part of the Rat Pack is on stage performing at uh, the Sands. Sinatra, Sammy Davis, and Peter, uh, and Dean Martin. Okay. After the show, they're going because they're going to ask Sinatra to do them a favor. After the show, um, they're going to go to Sinatra's dressing room and, and talk it over. So they go in there and they tell them we want them to come to Newark. They're going to throw their, they're going to, they're not going to throw their weight behind the, the black nationalists. They're not going to throw it behind the Italian of the Citizens Council. They're going to throw it behind the wealthy Italian because they think they can do business with him. Oh, the, the wealthy black, I'm sorry. So Sinatra says, why should I go? And he says, isn't the head of the Citizens Council Italian? Shouldn't I be going to support him? Frank, Frank, the man is an embarrassment, an embarrassment. He's an Italian, but he's a jabroni. He's a jerk off. And we can't have that. We can't have that. We got to protect what we got. So Sinatra does that. Sinatra goes in, and some of you may remember in Newark, the Mosque Theater, which was a national showpiece. It was unbelievable. 
And, it, it, you know, it fell into disrepute when the city went bad. It, it's now being rehabbed, I hope. But, and that's where I ushered. Anyway, they go to the mosque, and in the car, Sinatra brings with him Aretha Franklin and uh, another black singer. Oh, Lena Horne. Because, you know, Sinatra got Lena Horne into the hotel in Las Vegas. They were, she was performing there, and they wouldn't let her stay there. And Sinatra said, I go home if you don't let her. So he bring, and so it made sense if he could come. They wanted black people, and they wanted an attack. They were going to have a rally. Okay? They only needed to win one third of the black votes, and they would win the election. So that's, they set up this rally. And Sinatra is telling stories. He tells a story which really fits in with the history of Newark. He tells a story in the limo, which it's true. He says, you know, when I came here to this theater we're going to, I was on the balls of my ass. I left Tommy Dorsey. I was a single. I couldn't get any work. And the mosque was booking people, and I went there. But what happened was the guy who, and this is true, the guy who was a talent a, a, a agent for the live show circuit, Paramount Theaters around the country, he went there to see who the actors were, I mean, the, the performers were, he, he just looking for talent. He hears Sinatra. And that's the first time a woman threw her underwear from the audience at Frankie. And he sees it. And he says, he says, Sinatra says, he came in my dressing room. I said, I want you to sign a contract with me. And the guy said, who the hell are you? And I said, who the hell are you? I've been ripped off enough. You're going to open them at the Paramount in Brooklyn. Oh, God. And that was the start of Sinatra as an individual performer. I mean, that's when he began to get attention. Now, this guy was smart enough to plant four other women in that audience and have them throw their underwear at the stage. And, but there's a lot of true anecdotes in this book, a lot of them. Anyway, the big cause, you wonder who's going to win the election. But the real big cause is, are these two kids going to make it? And they come very close to not making it. But they don't lose their sense of reality. Um, to give you an example, I won't be giving away too much. Um, the boy gets shot coming out of the Feast of San Janeiro with her. Now they're in his home. But they finally, chapter 32 is gone. They finally tell the old man they have this tremendous traumatic scene. And the wife does something no Italian mother would do in those days in the North War. None. When he brings the black girl into the house, she runs into the kitchen and she's crying. He thinks she's crying because the son brought home a black girl. She's crying because she knows he's going to scream at the son. This is mothers and sons. That's when, that's the reason she's crying. And, and it gets really hot. And he says, I don't want to hear this. She gets up and does something that, and I've checked this with every Italian family I knew in the North Ward. They said it couldn't happen. She pushes him aside in the doorway and says, well, I want to hear the rest of this girl's story. And that turns, everything turns around after that. We have to get shot now, now that now the girl is in the house because now they, they like the girl. And she's sitting on the floor next to him and his leg is in a cast and set up on a hassock. And the doctor says to her, this is what I said before about everybody in Newark, everybody in New Jersey, particularly Newark, plays the dozens. And the doctor says, Miss, I don't know what you did, but you saved his life. How did you make a tourniquet? And she said, well, before she can answer, Romeo jumps in because you got to put, again, the put downs. And he says, Doc, most embarrassing day of my life. She pulls off her sweater. She takes off her bra and she makes a tourniquet. I was mortified by this. She looks at, now he's put her down. Now she looks at him and she says, 
Fish and Buster. Wasn't the first time I took off my bra for you. You keep talking like that, it damn sure will be the last. That was the kind of dialogue that goes through this book. Uh, I really hope, uh, I know some of you have the book. I hope you buy the book mainly because this is my, I'm, I just finished my 17th book. It's a ghost story about black baseball using the real people. But um, all of books, this is the one that means the most to me because it's Newark and Newark, Newark made me, whatever I am today, they made me. Uh, I guess I got the job. I worked at the ledger right after, before and after I came out of the service. And I, then I worked at the Herald Tribune, best newspaper the country ever had for three years. My desk set was right next to Red Smith, of course, from Walter Lippmann and uh, Kerr, the drama critic. It was my it was my kindergarten. That's how I learned about life. I remember Jimmy. I I traveled with all those guys who I idolized, and I realized that after if they could throw out the writing, it wasn't much about most of them to realize. See, you know, but but I never forget uh, Jimmy Cannon. We went I, wherever Cannon went. He was at the Post, and then he went into the Journal of America. Wherever he went, if, if I was at an event, I'd go there too. I wanted to learn from him. He liked me because I chased fire engines and led police plotters, just like he did when he was coming up. I didn't start in sports. So we go in a dressing room. The guy's been knocked out. It's a loser's dressing room. He's been knocked out. He's groggy. He's sitting up like that. And one of the imbeciles, says, I don't call them colleagues sometimes, one of those imbeciles says to him, did you see the punch? And Cannon says, idiot, if he saw the punch, we'd be in the other locker room. That's how I learned. Well, I've been at the ledger, I, I've been in this business 71 years now. Uh, I started when I was uh, a uh, junior in college. And outside of the Tribune and the Korean War, and one little hitch at a weekly paper, because when I came back from the Korean theater, I thought I knew everything. I wasn't gonna go back to the ledger. I told them over there, you're the, you're the poster boy for illiteracy. It was because Donald Newhouse, who really put it on its feet, made the eighth largest paper in America. He wasn't there yet. And uh, so I, other than those three, six, seven years, um, I would say 64 of those years was at the ledger. And um, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that because I met a lot of good people. And you know, I'm grateful for that. This is off the subject of the book, but I'm very grateful. Look, I did 53 straight Super Bowls. I, and then I couldn't walk well. I did 55 straight Kentucky Derbies. I, how many sports writers can say they spent a whole day at the Olympics with Nelson Mandela? I mean, that's pretty good company for a writer to be in. So all in all, I just, uh, I've been very lucky. I've, seen, I've covered every kind of sport you can cover. I covered Irish hurling in Yankee Stadium and, and uh, I covered, a, I once covered a fishing rodeo in Broad Market Street in Newark. That was a casting contest. Uh, whatever it was, I did it. I covered the original Mets, and I knew this was going to be a team worth covering because the first night they're going to open with a day game the next day in St. Louis against the Cardinals. And the Mets all crowded into an elevator going upstairs, and this elevator had a tape recording. So when you got in, the first thing you heard was Vicky Carr is singing on the roof. That was a supper club. Well, the elevator got stuck between floors. And for 10 minutes, I heard Vicky Carr is singing on the roof. Vicky Carr is singing on the roof. Vicky Carr is singing on the roof. And finally, Roger Craig says, get her the hell off the roof and get us out of this elevator. That's the way the match started. And three days later, I rode in the back of a garbage truck up uh, the, the, the Canyon of Heroes to City Hall with the, with the original Mets team. And when I never forget that day, they had a pitcher who had been in, 
came and graduated Yale. And Casey introduced some of his players and he said, this man here is the worst paid graduate of Yale University. I mean, we had so much. And triple crown, five triple crown winners in my lifetime. Plus, uh, I don't count citation, I was 18 years old. Five triple crown winners, 15 races for them to win it. I saw all 15 races. I was there when Secretariat won by 25 and a half lengths. It was the first time, the Belmont, it was the first time television um, had to split the screen. They couldn't get the rest of the field in. Then they learned a new technique. And Ron Turcotte, the jockey, ended up tragically in a wheelchair with good, really good rider. And Penny Chenery uh, was the owner. She, she, she won it. And she was a real good friend of mine. And the Secretariat had a great personality. There was a, the, the exercise boy once told me, um, Luke and Lauren, the trainer, said, Take him out. I don't want him to run. He can gallop a little bit, you know, but just reason. He takes him out. He's pulling on the reins because Secretary wants to run. It's 6 30 in the morning, you know. And Secretary says, Screw this. He jumps straight up in the air. The exercise guy's on his ass. Secretary goes about 10 feet, turns around, and stares at him. I am convinced it was deliberate and he knew what he was doing. Uh, and that day, he jumped. Uh, there was a horse thing that Sham. And Pancho Martin trained Sham. And he said, Wherever Secretary goes, I want you there. We're good. We beat him once, he beat us once, we're gonna kick his ass and we're gonna win the Belmont and take away his triple crown. Well, it's the biggest mistake Sham ever made because he never raced again. Secretary had broke him down and he was running and running and running away from the whole field. And I turned to the late Bob Harding, who was our race runner, I said, he's gonna kill the horse. It's gonna, he's gonna break down. Up in the box, Lucian turned to Penny Chenery and he said, Get me a gun. Somebody get me a gun. I'm going to kill that jockey. I'm going to kill him. He's going to kill our horse. But the horse kept going further and further and further away. Now they turn for home, okay? He doesn't hear anything. Now you can hear, jockeys can hear hoofbeats. So they know something's coming. Nothing's coming. And he makes the unpardonable, it's an unforgivable sin for a jockey. He turns in the saddle to see where everybody is. They're so far behind him. He turns back and when he told me the story, he said, and I looked up at this guy and I said, Lord, if you ever did anything for me, don't let me fall off this horse because I'm only a passenger today. Well, anyway, I, I hope, hope a lot of you read the book. The, the book means a lot to me. And I'll tell you what I'll do. People who have this book, um, not the other books right now, but this book. You got this book and you finish it. If you drop me an email at jeisenberg at starledger.com and with your name and what you thought of the book, I'm going to send you a book plate. And a lot of you don't know what that is. It's an oblong piece. Of, it's white got a design around it. It's stuck to, loosely stuck to a sheet of paper. I'll autograph it for you, say whatever I want to say. And then when you get it, you peel it off, slap it on the inside of the front cover, and you'll have an autograph copy. If you want it, you know. I don't do that with checks, guys, I'm sorry. Well, I guess that's about it. I'm willing to take questions, and questions about the book are welcome. Questions about Newark are welcome. Questions about my social life are, are not welcome. I'll tell you, I'm not going to none of your business. I won't answer it. <laughs> I probably will. Though. Okay, Bill Tittle, you're the first. I can't hear you. Hey, up on you. Gary, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting. I didn't go too long, I, I hope. No, 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 no. It was it was great. So so clearly you are a romantic 
And you oh, also I get around, you're gonna ruin my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. It's good with the chicks like it, I'm telling you. <laughs> I have a but... scar. I have a scar on my forehead. And when I went into a there was a young college girl who was a receptionist for the for the uh, eye doctor. And I said, I told her what happened. She says, I got a terrible scar right here. And she said to me, don't knock it. Chicks dig scars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I have a serious question for you. In sure. addition to being a romantic, you also clearly love life. So that's why I mean, I'm here. I'm 91. Yeah, well, okay. But you, you grew up Jewish. You must have experienced anti-Semitism, all the all over the world. Disappointing stuff. So but so how did you keep the love and life? I had the greatest teacher in the world, my father. My father came here in 1882, 84. He was a professional minor league baseball player down at the bottom. And um, one day he said to me, um, I said, you know, I heard words in school. I don't quite understand. I heard nigger and kike and, and, and guinea and, you know, but I, but I never heard them in this house. And my father said, you never will. Do you have any idea how many beanballs I dodged? I was the only Jew on the um, um, Hoboken team in his last league and the Delaware Lackawanna League. Um, and they threw, they didn't throw at my head, they threw behind my head. Because the natural reflex is to pull back. They're trying to kill me. So I, I, I dodged too many to, to take part in that. And he said, you keep bothering me. He had a little white patch between his left index finger and his thumb, round white circle. And I always asked him what it was. And all he would say is, souvenir baseball. It's all he would say, nothing else. Now when we're having this discussion, he said to me, okay, I'm going to tell you what this white circle is. The last game I played, we were up in Gloversville, New York. And that night, we win the game. I'm going to take a train home, Delaware Lackawanna Railroad. And... Um, that night we go out and it gets very wet out. Oh, I drink, my father's not a drinker, but I drink more than I normally drink. And anyway, apparently we wound up at a tattoo parlor. So I'm looking at my fingers and I realized in those days, now this is what we're talking about the, we're talking about the early 1900s. Uh, Cause he, he went off to World War I and he didn't play after, after he got hurt and wounded. And, uh, he said, you know, I'm telling you now, in those days, Jews believed mostly. A lot of rabbis did too. There was no there's no stricture about it, but they believed if you had tattoos, you couldn't be buried in a Jewish cemetery. And the reason for that, they their their reasoning was, thou shalt have no graven images before me. And this uh -huh. was so my old man looks down and he sees some kind of squirrel or rat or whatever in that little where that little circle was. Right? <laughs> He said, and he's living, this is last year in baseball, and they're paying for a nurse to be with his mother because they needed him. And uh, uh, they only made one road trip. Uh, I mean, they made it like four times. And Glover is really in Troy because they were close together. And he's, but so he was living and taking care of his mother because he had quit baseball, but he went back for one year. And he said, I can't go home with this. My mother will see this thing here. She'll hit me in the head with a frying pan. I, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> he went. I said, so how did it turn white? He said, I bought a bottle of acid. And I burned that skin right off me. And no skin ever grew there again. Well, he, was a good, he was a good reference point about, about religion. And we did, my father was what I call a... a a cultural Jew more than a ritualistic Jew. He didn't go to synagogue very much. And, uh, but, you know, we're, our big fight, I'm 10 years old, right? 
I want to be a ball player like him, and I want to play second base like he did, okay? So every chance I get, every chance I get, I'm in the park. And uh, now he says to me, oh, I'm 10 years old. I'm in the fifth grade. He says, now you're going to go to Cheder. You're going to go to Hebrew school two days a week. After I said, after regular school, that's torture. He said, you're going to go. And I said, well, I don't want to go. I want to play baseball. He said, I've seen you play baseball. It's not worth it. You're going to go two days. And I said, well, I don't want to. I never see you in shul. Why is that? Well, don't worry about me. And the truth is, I did see him in synagogue. We lived half a block from B'nai Abraham in Newark. It was the most ornate temple at that time in the state. We didn't belong to it. You know, but, but, but that's where I was born, Mitzvah. And he, uh, um, there was a, um, I, I saw him twice in the synagogue, my bar mitzvah and his funeral. That was it. But he, he really, he was a tough guy. He'd fight you. He fought a lot of guys before he had me over this Jewish thing. But he never looked for trouble. I mean, he was, a, he was an interesting guy. He, he, he had a, just a knack about him and he, he taught by example. I'll never forget this. I come home, I'm not married yet. I'm going on a road trip now because I, the ledger has rehired me. Big road trip. I'm going to Philadelphia, I'm going from Newark to Philadelphia to the PGA Golf Tournament. I'm 21 years old. I think I'm a big deal, right? I'm going to have a little expense account. I mean, I, I can, they'll pay for my meals. I get down there and I'm going to just, and I'm just back in Korea. I'm going to run a market. I'm convinced. Road trip, important guy now. I'm really going to get a file on it. My father says, come here, I want to talk to you. He says, I see you're going on a road trip now. I said, yeah. He said, let me tell you something. The road can make a bum out of the best of us. And I, I know it from baseball, but don't ask me how I know it. That's not, that part's none of your business. So make me a promise. You will not go to bed with anyone you're ashamed to wake up with in the morning. 15 years go by, I'm married, I'm divorced, uh, I'm single between weddings, and uh, I go to Green Bay for a football game, and it is cold. The hotel was called the Great Northern. It wasn't great, and boy, was it Northern. And three o'clock in the morning, I meet this, Young lady, I found out she went so young later, but what did I know? Um, and she looks at me and I look at her and straighten my tie. I was, in those days I wore ties, schmuck. And, and so, you know, we, we, we strike a, hey, look, it's amazing what women can look like when you're drunk at three o'clock in the morning. You're right. I often wonder if we look like that to them. Anyway, we go upstairs, okay? We, we, well, yeah, I don't have to describe what happened. You know what happened. Now it's the next morning. There are no Venetian blinds in that hotel. There are shades. And they have the texture of the parchment that Trappist monks used to write hymns on, okay? So they tear very easily. There's a tear from the upper left-hand corner of the shade down to the lower right-hand corner of the shade. So I, the sun is streaming in at me. I jump up, I gotta figure out where I am. What, and I hear this. <laughs> I turn, I look and I say, mother of God, I'm in bed with a water buffalo. And then I look at the ceiling and I say, should have listened, dad, should have listened. Anybody else got a question? I, I, I go off like that sometimes. <laughs> Mitch. Yeah, hey, Jerry, thank you so much. And uh, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, the the old guard, several of us have talked about your book and the reaction has been generally really good. I'm speaking specifically about the after the fire, not all the yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. And, and my question, though, is uh, there's a fair, uh, you know, your book is a is a uh, an indictment of, of Newark in the day and all of those problems that happened in the 60s in Newark. 
and I want to know what's the reaction been within uh, among the people within Newark in terms of you know. It, that's uh, very interesting. Go ahead. The blacks seem to like it. Um, Puerto Ricans, uh, well, that's it. I am not in touch with the generation that would read it and that doesn't speak Spanish, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but but the blacks like it. Um, people who used to live there and are white like it. And also, I'm, I, I was kind of surprised. Most of the Italians have moved out of the North Ward. It's really a Puerto Rican ward mostly now. Uh, they're all down the shore, basically, most of them, the Jersey Shore. And uh, that, that's funny, I said they're down the shore. I'm talking to the only audience that will understand what I mean by down the shore. There, nobody here knows anything. <laughs> uh, and and uh, to them, like me, which is disappearing, is the shore. And and uh, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. A very, her husband was a very important person in Newark, Italian. Uh, she's a widow now. Um, and she called me up because I knew her. She said she thought the book was fabulous. She said, because we're not proud of a lot of this, you know, but that's the way it was. And she said, you really captured it. And uh, it's a, it's a very fair question. I, I I think I would think there are people who really didn't like it. You know, well, the ones who see themselves in it. And, and look, I'll put it this way. My, a lot of people ask me, are these people real? Are they based on people or whatever? And I tell them the same thing. My lawyer tells me they're not. And I'm not going to argue with my lawyer. So... That tells you how many real people are probably in the book. <laughs> and they and those people who recognize themselves, the ones that are still with us. Thank you so much. And by the way, I'm going to take you up on your book plate offer. Oh, yeah. No, any, and that goes for anybody, anybody who, who has the book. But they got to tell me what they thought of the book. I, 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 I'm not going to be offended if someone says I really didn't like it. That's okay. I'll just write something nasty on a book plate, you know. <laughs> Listen, guys, I, I really enjoyed this. Yeah. And next week, I'm going to take you. I'm going to take you through the Super Bowl. More than 50 years of it. How it became an icon, how it became a pain in the ass, and how it became an industry. And I'm going to start you off with the very first Super Bowl. The first six Super Bowls. I could interview guys in our hotel rooms. Then the NFL Gestapo took over, so that was that. Thanks, guys. J like Jerry, we have one more it. question, Ed Atkin. Did I chase anybody out? No, 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 we have one more question, Ed. It's up to you, Ed Atkin. Can you tell us how the riots State changed oh. Irvington? Oh, okay. That's a good question because- We had a store in Irvington. Yeah, where? Springfield Avenue. You're yeah, where? Uh, between uh, Clinton and New Street, Atkins, Kurt, Lynn, Drapery, Bedspread Store. Yeah, I don't know the store, but I know the neighborhood. I grew up in Clinton Hill. And uh, how it came to Irvington? I can't really tell you what, what was there. I mean, what was your, was your store torched and damaged and whatever? No, we had no damage. We had no gates, nothing on the store. I'm surprised when you say that riot came to her. I, I didn't know that because I was running all over Newark, you know, tracking down where the real action was. And uh, that's another thing about this book. If you notice how the, the stores disappear on Springfield Avenue in Newark in this book after the riot. And... One thing I, about this that I can tell you, um, the guy became a very prominent Newark citizen. Uh, he was a Portuguese guy. He was a cop who told me the anecdote about they had no training for riots. They didn't know what the hell to do. And they kept getting different orders. And finally, it's in the book, this guy comes, captain comes running through and he says, kill a bastard. Shoot the bastards, kill them, kill them. And he and the guy said to me, that's when I figured 
I would go around the corner and protect some other street. And it was total chaos. They, they didn't know what they were doing. They couldn't, they weren't prepared at all for it. And, you, and it was coming, it was real. I mean, look, the, with a the trigger, you, uh, the, you, I'll tell you guys, if you, you, may, you should know, a cab driver, when he was beaten up, that started the riot. Um, he, he passed a police car that was double parked. Um, they pulled him out of the cab. They beat the crap out of him. He, he almost died. And they threw him and he took him to the precinct house. So, opposite, so of all the places to take a precinct house opposite Hayes Homes, that's where the crowd came from to stand in front of the precinct house. That's where the riot started. And, and um, uh, but there was a, 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 you could see it coming. The medic, they were gonna build a medical school. And they took, I forget how many acres, uh, I mean, it's a lot of land for the hospital and the school and whatever else. And they dispossessed nothing but blacks to take it, eminent domain. And um, that was the argument that uh, Leroy Jones and other legitimate civil rights people used about it. And that made the tensions get hotter. Then they were gonna build a, uh, Jones had bought, had got some land, he's gonna build something called Coweta Towers, which is gonna be all black in the heart of the Italian war. That didn't add much to peace and harmony either. And when this guy was beaten up, he worked for a black cab company, black owned cab company. And um, they were on a, on a radio saying he's, he, he could die, he's badly beaten, blah, blah, blah. Eight hours later, one of the cab drivers said, he just died. That's when the riot kicked off. Uh, he didn't die, but you know how it is. It's a, it's like you know, the, the underground uh, gossip, you know, you'll say, uh, you'll say, I saw the game yesterday and the guy scored two touchdowns. And by the time it gets to the fifth repeat, the guy scored six touchdowns. That's why they, somebody said the guy was dead, he wasn't. That's what triggered the whole riot. I didn't even know, I'll tell you how, how localized it was. This woman who told me she loved the book, because that's, she said that's the way we were. And she was talking about her husband. Uh, she told me that she lived in the East Ward, to the port, in the Portuguese Ward. There was a small enclave of Italians and Poles. She said, I didn't even know the riot was going on. She was a school kid because nothing happened in the East Ward. It was like, it was like somebody had told the East Ward, one day there's going to be, a, their mother said to them, one day you're going to have a riot, okay? Mind your business. <laughs> that's, that's, they were out of the riot. They were not involved in it at all. I think the riot went just south, I guess, just, I guess, east of the Parkway Apartments. It never seemed to really get to the center of Irvington. Oh, I know where that is. I, I, my mother lived around the corner for a while in the, in the high rises. Yeah. But I didn't know there. I didn't know there was a riot or anything. I know there's one in Plainfield. Yes. And a woman got the biggest sentence for clubbing this guy. I think he might have died, a cop. And uh, Asbury Park had a riot, which was really more of a looting than a riot. Um, they didn't have any real bitches down here. But Newark had it coming. I mean, uh, you can't, I don't mean by that they deserved it. But I mean, if, you're, if you walked around with your eyes open, you knew what was happening. And I'll tell you, there were some ugly, ugly incidents that my wife and I shared. And if you want to see that beautiful woman, it's a picture of her and me in the book at the back of the book. Uh, but uh, there was, she, we went through some interesting stuff. You know which city, because I, I kept working in the meantime, and by that time she was traveling with me. She, had, she was working, but weekend travel she could make. You know, there was one city in this country at that time. You got to remember the climate of the country. People stare at mixed couples. I, mean, I used to tell my wife, well, that's because you're so beautiful. That's why they're staring, you know. But I knew why they were staring, so did she. But um, it was, um, 
one city, we never had one moment of trouble in. Take a guess, somebody take a guess, what city? One New York. Okay. New Orleans. Where? New Orleans. You got it. You got it because one third of the population is mixed. They're, they have three mixed mayors. So we didn't uh, really like going there. But uh, it's interesting how things change, really. People who would not have spoken to us then, no doubt, speak to us today. We're not we're there anymore, but I'm sure. They I'll tell you one last thing. I'm, I'm, you know, I used to, people used to pay to hear me speak. Now I empty rooms when I speak because I can't stop. But I'll tell you that, that um, well, I, I'll never tell you because I'm 91 years old and it just fell out of my mind. <laughs> I really did want to tell you one thing about this. Oh, yeah. Writing, I wanted to write this book desperately. Desperately. I had never written any fiction. And I tried a couple of times, but the plot for this came to me and I said, you know, I live, I live most of this book, really. I'm not going to lie about that. I lived it anyway. Eileen lived a little bit of it. So I wanted to get it all. I got it. You know, I, I was 88 years old when I started it. Uh, you know, I don't know if I was going to be alive to finish it. So I pushed to get it done. It was the top of my bucket list. And the second thing on my bucket list, I don't think I'm going to be able to do because I'm walking so poorly. I wanted to go back to the streets of this riot and walk through them today and see what they're like. That's, that's the next thing, but that one ain't going gonna, ain't gonna to get done. Well, I enjoy it, you know. Okay, uh, Steve Morley. Okay, thank you, Joel. Jerry, thank you for an extraordinary talk. You mentioned that you have nothing but good memories of Newark. Yeah. The Newark Bears and the Newark Eagles. Yeah. Not needing a lock because there was nothing to steal. Saying why to dad and knowing mafioso such as Gambino, Boyardo, Uncle Petey. You know, listening to you was uh, like having a, a living history tutorial today. <laughs> and all that we can say is that uh, you may now live in Nevada, but you are truly a Jersey guy and a Newark guy forever. We have uh, two ways, Jerry, of uh, thanking our speakers. Oh, you're up to thank me. The uh, first is with a certificate of appreciation. Uh, Hello, not, as, uh, oh. not as good as a plate, oh. but uh, it's what we have. Uh, and you'll notice that there is a, an orchid on the lower left-hand side of that yes, certificate. I do. And there's a reason for that, because back in 1930, which happened to be the year you were born as well, that's when the, uh, the old guard was founded. And at that time, Summit was at the epicenter of the uh, nation's orchid growing and distribution industry. Really? I, I never knew that. I knew, yeah. I knew about the roses in Madison. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, but I exactly. didn't know about the orchids. Yeah. And so it, it was natural for our founders to pick the, uh, the orchid as, uh, as our uh, logo. And uh, the second way we have uh, of thanking our speakers, uh, if we can unmute everyone, is, uh, is with the old guard salute. Yay! Thank you, guys. All right. How many, how many people did you have? Good job, Jerry. How many, how, people, how many people did you have? Uh, just under 100. We'll have an exact count later. Well, that's wonderful. And we're really looking forward to next week. Oh, yes. well, well, that, yeah. Yep. You, you will like it next week. You'll, <laughs> you'll learn a lot about, you know, I'll never forget Stanley Woodward, was the greatest editor, not the greatest sports editor the greatest editor that ever lived. And he was a surrogate father to me for a couple of years after my father's passed away. Too. And he taught me, what he taught me, he didn't teach me much about words. Um, I, that was before. My writing stems from the fact that I was a musician and that translates in a very obtuse way. I'm mean, not gonna bore you with it. But uh, he used to say, hey, Stop guarding up those athletes. As far as a guy hits a ball 500 feet, don't let him chart the course of your life. And that's, that was great advice. That's the way you take it. Guys, thank you again. Thank you very much. My pleasure.